The health ministry in Gaza has reported that the number of dead Palestinians in the besieged enclave has crossed 7,000, of whom nearly 3,000 are children. The Israelis have asked for the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, to resign after he said Hamas's attack on Israeli settlements didn't happen in a vacuum. Meanwhile, Turkey today uh, has uh, called the West's continued lack of action a shame on humanity. Why is the United States, the self-proclaimed leader of the free world, still not calling for or even imposing a ceasefire? It's not just on the foreign policy front that the US government has been uh, in a state of uh, relative paralysis of late. The long-running drama of electing a new speaker to the House of Representatives, one of the top political jobs in the country, has ended for now. Mike Johnson is the new man on the job. He's a virtual unknown. But has the Republican far right got the man it wanted? And in the Indo-Pacific, Japan and the Philippines are talking about extending military cooperation as they have been for a while now. Uh, in the latest developments uh, in these long underway discussions, reports indicate that the two countries are close to working out the modalities of a visiting forces agreement. What does this imply for stability? in the Indo-Pacific, which is, of course, a focal point of the standoff between the US and China. Salams, you're watching Daily Debrief coming to you uh, from People's Dispatch. Before we go any further, take a second and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Right, our lead story, as it has been for uh, most of uh, Daily Debrief since the 7th of October, after Hamas launched Operation Al-Aqsa flood, and in response, uh, the Israelis unleashed an all-out siege and war on the besieged enclave of Gaza. In latest reports coming in, the Palestinian Health Ministry, as I was saying earlier, uh, has reported that the death toll uh, of Palestinians killed in Israeli strikes and bombardment has crossed 7,000. 3,000 of those are children. They are also elderly, as well as women who have been killed. Journalists, health workers, uh, those on the ground, nobody is currently safe uh, in Gaza, as indeed we'll probably find out in parts of the West Bank as well. Offensives are on. Uh, and um, in southern Gaza as well, where uh, Gazans were told to evacuate to and leave by the Israeli military. Um, we'll get the latest, including updates on two additional failed resolutions at the United Nations Security Council from Abdul, who is covering the story for People's Dispatch. Abdul, good to have you with us. Uh, of course, we, we had a bit of a break yesterday because uh, we had a special with Zoe uh, and Vijay Prashad on uh, Gaza and the situation uh, in the broader context in Palestine and Israel. Uh, but since uh, that time, Abdul, things are continuing. Uh, the strikes on Gaza continues continue and uh, several, several more deaths have also been reported. What's the latest? Uh, as far as the updates are concerned, of course, the latest is that uh, Israel has basically started a land incursion uh, overnight on Wednesday, uh, which basically uh, it is not clear how, how intensive it was, but uh, you can say that the previous uh, smaller incursions they carried out uh, mm, this is what this was this was the biggest of all of them because this time they also used tanks so they went inside for a while and they had some uh, whatever uh, operations they had and they then moved out D this happened despite the the news uh, which was there reported by several agencies uh, including the ap that the us had basically uh, asked israeli ground offensive to kind of be delayed because they are not very sure what would be the repercussions, not only uh, in, in the occupied Palestinian territories, but also in the larger uh, region. Because as the latest reports are coming, uh, the US uh, bases in Syria and in Iraq ha have come under attack. There are reports of them being targeted uh, with missiles and so on and so forth. So is, uh, US is not sure about that front and therefore it wanted to kind of delay the ground offensive uh, inside Gaza. Uh, there was another reason cited by the US 
which is related to uh, the hostages, uh, which they claim uh, to be more than 200 uh, uh, people who were taken hostages during the Operation Alaksa flood uh, on the first day uh, on the 7th October. And the uh, US wants to secure uh, the release of maximum of those hostages before a land incursion, <coughs> sorry, a land offensive uh, uh, can happen. But despite all those precautions and the warnings and the uh, hesitations which were shown by the US, what we saw that uh, on, uh, on Wednesday uh, night, uh, the, uh, the Israeli army went in uh, to Gaza. And, and that basically could have added into the number of uh, uh, the, the, the deaths, which basically have increased more than 1,200 overnight, if you overnight and early morning on Thursday. So uh, uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, 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 when we talk about Gaza, of course, there are uh, there are there are uh, already reports that how journalists, there are two prominent journalists who have been basically um, one is reported killed in the Israeli attack, uh, the local uh, Gaza uh, radio reporter and another one's family, Al Jazeera's reporter's family was killed. All the family members were killed uh, in, in Israeli bombing. Uh, uh, of course, on the other humanitarian front, uh, the situation becomes even worse. Uh, Israel has not uh, uh, eased any uh, restrictions on the supply of humanitarian uh, goods, uh, include, mm -hmm. including the fuel, which basically has led to almost shutting down of all the hospitals in the occupied uh, uh, Gaza uh, uh, in last few hours. And this is going to be a very big uh, uh, issue in the coming days if there is no relaxation given. So this is on the ground. Of course, there are uh, offensives on the West Bank, uh, also occupied West Bank. Also, uh, more than 100 uh, Palestinians were ar again arrested um, a few days back. Uh, the Israeli forces had arrested more than 100 Palestinians and killed uh, uh, around seven people on Monday. Uh, and this has continued on uh, Wednesday as well. Uh, uh, though the number of the, uh, 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 killed Palestinians is not very obvious, but uh, uh, Wafa reported that more than 100 of the Palestinians across the occupied West Bank were uh, detained uh, by the Israeli occupation forces. So on, uh, it seems that there is two-way uh, uh, war going on by the Israelis in the occupied uh, Palestinian territories. Abdul, we have to uh, talk a bit about what's happening on the diplomatic front as well. Uh, in the United Nations Security Council, uh, little or no progress uh, being made in terms of moves towards pressurizing the Israeli military uh, into a ceasefire. And the United States, which is uh, by, by any regard one of the major players in not just this region, but in uh, geopolitics, uh, unable to exert any real influence to to bring this about beyond beyond you know the the lip service that we've mentioned uh, whether it's joe biden or or other leaders uh, talking about how how uh, much they are upset by the loss of palestinian lives but unable to sort of uh, contain their biggest allies or even even get them to budge an inch on on what is this total war uh, kind of philosophy in fact, uh, I, I would completely uh, 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 kind of disagree on the point that they were trying to and uh, were unable to uh, uh, exert any pressure on the Israeli. In fact, if you see, they are basically backing whatever Israel is doing and they do not want any humanitarian ceasefire at this moment. And that is why the kind of maneuvers, the kind of games which are played in the United Nations Security Council over the wordings here and there, on each resolution, they have certain problems. And those problems are basically, it's see, now it is very clear that those problems cited by the US is basically a way to delay uh, any uh, decision taken by the United Nations Security Council. Though. Um, one is not clear whether, even if there is a resolution passed uh, tomorrow in the United Nations Security Council, whether it will be uh, implemented on the ground, whether Israel will be ready to implement that. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, given its value uh, uh, in the uh, larger uh, world diplomatic circles, given the, its symbolic value and given the fact that it 
the there is the possibility of its being implemented uh, somehow uh, is uh, us does not want uh, that to happen and that's exactly what happened if you see what happened on wednesday uh, during the two resolutions which were produced uh, in the united nations security council one was the us resolution which was uh, proposed uh, by the us uh, itself um, after going through much deliberations and all what what they, what did they came up with they basically tried to say exactly what israel has been claiming and they they basically went ahead and said that israel has an inherent right to self determine uh, sorry self defense and that basically implied that there will be no ceasefire there will be only a humanitarian pause uh, these were the wordings with which uh, us wanted to kind of uh, 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 wanted other members of the united nations security council to uh, uh, vote uh, uh, and adopt this resolution of course uh, china very strongly opposed the wordings of this particular resolution saying that this if this is adopted then the entire principles on which the uh, 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 united nations is based will be completely compromised for the future generations to come and therefore this is not acceptable the china voted against it russia voted against it uh, and uh, even uae uh, which is considered to be quite closer to the us voted against it uh, brazil and mozambique abstained uh, then uh, when this did not happen of course there a second resolution were proposed by russia which basically repeated what russia has earlier said uh, uh, that there should be a humanitarian ceasefire immediately and uh, uh, and basically asking all the parties to vote for it this also did not uh, pass of course we know because of the pressures a uh, pressure exerted by the uh, the us and its western uh, allies which are the permanent members in the un security council which is uh, the uk and the france uh, uk and france and mm -hmm. that basically led to the 10 countries abstaining uh, and which uh, basically uh, kind of disqualifying the resolution for the second round of the voting which is required for uh, its final adoption so uh, it seems that the us uh, after this happened anthony blinken comes and says that we want uh, a humanitarian pause in uh, 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 occupied uh, in, in gaza uh, this is only uh, for the public uh, consumption it seems now at this moment it is an attempt to kind of save face given the fact that uh, us has shamelessly backed uh, whatever israel is doing there has not even uh, in fact has tried to justify the killing of innocent civilians killing of children saying that these are all uh, uh, the results of the war which palestinians have waged uh, uh, so you can understand that on this particular issue it, more than israel it is the us which, which basically has taken public instances which basically support uh, uh, the uh, the israeli actions and in fact also has participated indirectly or indirectly of course weapons are supplied to uh, so yeah. all the ammunitions which are basically dumped in gaza basic most of them come now from the united states so it is uh, you can we can safely say that us is part of the war and therefore it does not want to uh, uh, kind of uh, put israel into a difficult situation while voting in favor of a resolution which demands ceasefire at least for a while now all right thanks very much abdul for that update and for very clearly putting into perspective actually what has been uh, the U.S. effort, which is quite contrary to public statements coming from some of its leadership and actually indicating, as Abdul was pointing out, uh, exactly the opposite uh, and, and, and showing how complicit the United States is in this ongoing offensive uh, against Gaza and against the people of Palestine, including those who are in the occupied West Bank uh, and elsewhere, of course. And we've also seen uh, concurrently uh, massive outpouring of solidarity with uh, the Palestinian people, including massive rallies in parts of uh, the United States, which People's Dispatch has been reporting on. Uh, please do go to our website for continued coverage and regular updates on the situation uh, in Gaza. But we leave that for now and move on to uh, the next story, where also some bits of, of course, uh, the situation in Palestine uh, will come up, uh, which is that after a long running drama, the United States House of Representatives has a new speaker. Mike Johnson, uh, the 51-year-old from Louisiana, is the man who takes this one of the top jobs 
in U.S. politics. He's a relative unknown, according to reports that I have at least read uh, from the U.S. media, relative unknown even when it comes to uh, the United States itself. Uh, but in terms of uh, his views, uh, he's ultra conservative. Uh, he's uh, almost a protege of Jim Jordan, who uh, the far right uh, section of the Republican Party wanted in this job, but was perhaps uh, too uh, toxic or too too problematic to actually put into that position. Uh, Anish, uh, you are uh, following developments, uh, and we and we've talked about uh, this before on daily debrief of course uh, before we go into the kind of role uh, that the new speaker will have in uh, governance in the united states tell us a little bit about mike johnson well uh, what we're looking at is uh, a candidate a speaker uh, which would be uh, the most right-wing speaker that uh, the united states has seen uh, probably since the segregation era it is uh, uh, and Actually, I would have to differ with you about uh, him being the protege of the, of Jim Jordan and the fact and the and those factions because actually uh, Johnson belongs to a different faction of a very hardliner uh, religious uh, you know conservative uh, group within the Republican Party, the Christian Right group, uh, who pretty much have the most reactionary uh, stand on pretty much anything. Uh, that we can think of at this point in time, be it LGBT uh, protections or uh, you know matters of uh, you know environmental laws, labor laws, uh, or even for that matter, uh, uh, his uh, him actually uh, declining or you know uh, criticizing secularism and the secular and the separation of the state and the church in the United States, which is one of the hallmark features of his constitution. So it is part of that group uh, where you actually see a more right-wing uh, faction and the consolidation behind this right-winger uh, in the among the House Republicans, which has been uh, a divided house until very recently, uh, until a couple of days ago, actually. And it's this consolidation that should be far more, uh, uh, you know, concerning for anybody who is watching. Uh, U.S. politics right now because what we're looking at is the Republicans uh, trying to. So we actually seen uh, a more uh, sort of consolidation around Trump, but even there you had very differing uh, uh, variations of uh, agreement on how they support uh, Trump and his candidacy and his politics even. But uh, in this case, what we're looking at is somebody who is a hardliner in every manner. And form, it's not a new right or an alt right. It's the very old traditional Christian right wing that we are seeing right now. And this person is the one that is now uh, probably uniting the House Republicans in the United States. Right. On uh, the small matter of an election coming up in 2024 uh, as well, Anish. But but we won't get into that on, on today's conversation because I think we, we should hopefully have plenty of time to to build up to that a mega event but just in terms of the immediate sort of things that or role that uh, johnson might play in governance in the united states there is an additional 105 billion dollars or so uh, in aid uh, to ukraine uh, to israel um, and of course also a request to fund the government to prevent a shutdown what what, what is likely what are we likely to see over the next few weeks um, in terms of U.S. Uh, domestic politics? Well, what we're seeing right now, uh, like with the statements at the very least, is how the Republicans are pretty much uh, gearing up uh, for a confrontation with the Democrats and obviously the Biden administration uh, to push for the kind of budget cuts that they have been talking about for months now. And uh, it is quite likely that we are going to see a heightened form of confrontation uh, in the House of Representatives, which is the one that uh, has to, uh, you know, pass the uh, pass the budget, basically, the spending bill uh, for the next year. And uh, now with uh, November being their, uh, you know, their final date, uh, due date, uh, for uh, to prevent any kind of uh, non-payment of their existing loans or non-servicing of their existing loans, a national debt. Uh, we have to see how uh, far these confrontations will go. 
uh, whether the right wing and this is where that is where the uh, the battle lies actually and to see how uh, significant the right wing uh, or the far right uh, within the republican party are right now uh, and if uh, they're going to uh, allow for any kind of compromise with the democrats on certain issues uh, be it on ukraine because some of them have actually opposed uh, sending aid to ukraine uh, even though a majority of the republicans do not uh, uh, feel the same uh, we also see some uh, level of uh, you know calls for cutting down on several a whole host of uh, welfare policies uh, welfare programs uh, including uh, for healthcare including for uh, education and uh, all sorts of things that can actually improve uh, you know lives of millions of uh, working class americans but obviously uh, this is going to be the new battleground right now for and they and we have to remember these are very very basic uh, concessions that the democrats are also uh, uh, ex- accepting to give uh, to the working class americans so it's not something that is too radical that the republicans are opposing at this point but we have to see how far and how uncompromising this new republican uh, house will be in the coming weeks and as i said if they do not have a spending bill or if they do not come around uh, on how to service their national debt which is i think about uh, you know more than 21 trillion dollars at this point in time uh, mm-hmm. much far bigger than their national economy uh, mm-hmm. if they do not uh, find a way to service that uh, debt they are definitely going to have a bigger problem than just uh, you know political polarization with the possibilities and differences but but but, but to to uh, expect uh, uncompromising uh, i guess uh, opposition to anything that that my the democrats might put up thanks very much for that anish uh, stick around because our last story of the day is uh, from uh, another region that you look at for people's dispatch which is of course uh, the indo pacific as we were mentioning earlier japan and the philippines are now in advanced stages of long uh, underway negotiations for a reciprocal access agreement which is essentially allows each other's militaries visiting rights uh, to bases and other parts of each other's country this is this will be if it is signed uh, japan's first such uh, visiting uh, forces agreement with a member nation of the asean uh, grouping anish uh, we'll keep it slightly short uh, if you can just sum up how these negotiations have gone uh, japan already has similar deals if i'm not wrong uh, in place with australia and the united kingdom uh, but in the indo pacific which is a, a focal point of this standoff that is currently on between the us and china uh, what what implications does it have well, this this is only a continuation of what we have been talking about uh, for a while on the show about how the philippines is uh, pivoting uh, very extremely to the us uh, led coalition forces uh, in the asia pacific region and uh, mm-hmm. japan being that uh, pivot also makes a big difference at this point we uh, uh, this is also considering the long history and you know a very violent history of uh, uh, you know colonialism and invasions that japan has inflicted during the second world war obviously uh, on the philippines and uh, you know the kind of uh, massacres that have happened there uh, this is despite all of that history uh, for going all over pretty much uh, a large part of the crimes that were committed uh, there is pretty much no talk from the philippines establishment especially under duterte junior sorry marcos junior uh, on these matters uh, making it very clear that they are ready very much ready to compromise uh, on you know national concerns uh, if it means uh, they get to be more cozy uh, with this uh, with this block of powers uh, on the other hand this is also an extension of japan's attempt to expand its military across the region and you know project its military prowess uh it has this uh, you know sort of five year plan to actually militarize itself and to uh, you know institute a proper official military undermining its uh, pacifist constitution at the current moment uh, that the kishida government had uh, adopted last year and so in this uh, actually allowing and you know uh, seeking 
uh, visiting forces agreement with Philippines is going to be part of that uh, plan to actually expand Japan's uh, Japan's military power in the region in a manner that uh, where they can actually uh, not just send forces, but in the long run also probably establish basis uh the kind that the u.s has uh in a very similar arrangement that the u.s has with the philippines and obviously japan at this point in time so uh we have to wait and see like there is definitely there has always been opposition whether the philippines uh, especially among progressive groups who have uh opposed any kind of uh military ties or military arrangements uh with foreign powers especially bigger foreign powers who are in you know a confrontational position uh, with their neighborhood, uh, if, no matter what their concerns be about uh, you know the disputes that they have with China. Uh, despite that, uh, we are seeing this government actually hurtling through this uh, move to actually uh, get uh, a visiting forces agreement or a reciprocal uh, arrangement, a military arrangement uh, with the, with Japan by next year. And that is a very concerning thing, and that will obviously heighten tensions in a region that wasn't that very well known for tensions just a couple of years ago, uh, especially among pretty much all the countries at this point in time. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much for for updates on both those uh, developing stories, Anish. And, and with that, we'll bring this episode of Daily Debrief to a close. From uh, Abdul, Anish, myself. Uh, and the entire team here at People's Dispatch, thank you very much for watching. Uh, as always, and as we said earlier, please head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for details on these stories and all of the rest of the work that we do. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with another episode of The Daily Debrief. Until then, goodbye.